Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk to you guys about AI safety, which covers generative models in general, so all of AI models. Um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit in the beginning is the things that we should consider as both as users of AI and also as you guys as like the next generation of people that build capabilities into AI models, just being aware of all of the risks of models that we build and like machine learning models that we train and then deploy as products. And then I'll also go over some of the ways that people in the community are working on mitigating these risks and trying to make models safer, um, both for all types of generative models, both language models and vision models and everything else. I think the focus of this talk is mostly going to be on language models just because the the really like deep safety work over the last few years has been done on language models, but it will briefly touch on vision models, reinforcement learning models, and some others. And also feel free to reach out if you have questions about anything that's not covered in this talk, because this really just gives you a breadth of this space rather than just like deeply going into every possible thing that has been done. Um, feel free to also interrupt with questions at any point in between, like just stop me and raise your hand, and I'll also leave lots of time at the end for questions. But with that, let's begin with an illustrative example of where AI safety can go wrong and how it can be harmful. So we're going to look at translation as an example. And this is a real life story that happened maybe like seven years ago now. A man in Israel seven years ago on Facebook posted a picture of him with his tractor, as you can see over there. And he posted in his native language text that just said, good morning, to his friends and all the people that followed him on Facebook. Now, Facebook's internal machine translation model, which is just like a language model that has been trained on lots of data to translate from one language to another for many different source and target languages, incorrectly translated good morning in that source language to attack them in English. This post then went viral. Lots of people, people that didn't even follow this person um, on Facebook, it spread to like many different networks and caused so much alarm that the Israeli police were then called in to try to figure out why this man wanted to attack someone with his tractor and if this was like a safety concern. And the police actually ended up arresting this man. So this is obviously kind of like an outlier example of like how drastically bad these AI safety examples can go and can affect people's lives. But this is a real life example of an AI model that did actually affect someone's life so negatively that it ended up in like the sort of trauma that affects them with like police showing up at their door. Um, and the reason that this really happened is because at this time, when Facebook or anyone else was deploying these translation models on their websites, they didn't really deeply understand the landscape and properly think about the potential effects that this model could have had. So if they had foreseen this circumstance or thought about all the possible ways in which their language model could have translated something incorrectly, and just like asked the question of whether or not there was some context in which if this model was incorrectly deployed, could it harm people? This probably could have been mitigated. Um, a little in retrospect, at least. Another illustrative example is, this is from maybe also five to 10 years ago now. Um, there was this really groundbreaking paper called Gender Sh Shades, where they found that all of the classic image classification models, so CNNs and ResNet models, and all of the state-of-the-art models um, were just overly misclassifying only faces of people that had darker skin tones. So they had really perfect accuracy on people that had very light and fairer skin tones, and they would always incorrectly classify images um, just for like natural images that occur on the internet for like certain demographic groups of people. Um, this is obviously just like an inherently biased system now because it's behaving very differently for different people just based on like attributes of that person, which is not something that we want. But what people also saw later is that when these models were used, for example, in like security detectors, where if you just like scan a person's face and you want to classify it, there's like suspicious activity going on. When these classifiers were used, they obviously triggered these suspicious activity threats far more for people with darker skin as opposed to people with lighter skin. And again, uh, just like a consequence of when these products take these models that have biases in them, they don't fully think about all of the biases and the potential things that models might encode in them. And then when they're deploying these products and they don't actually ask the questions of, was my model biased? Does it exclude or misrepresent entire classes of people? 
Um, and this leads to very unsafe and biased behavior. So these are just two examples from the last 10 years. There's actually just like hundreds of these if you go through the literature. And there's links to lots of papers that cover this. Um, but there's lots and lots of instances of how when we don't think about the consequences and all of the safety risks that come into play when we're building machine learning models, they actually do affect people's lives. Because we're kind of at the point now where everyone is interacting with these um, models in lots of different ways, either knowingly or unknowingly, like through news feeds and things that you see from other people. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind all of these um, questions. So what I'm going to go over now before we jump into the more technical things is just what safety practitioners have laid out as the ethical concerns of having machine learning models and any AI models out in these environments that we interact with them in. So I'm going to go over these three broad categories of how these systems could be unsafe. So either they're risk to humans, they're risk by humans, when humans can maliciously use these systems to create further harm, and then also the risk to the environment when we're training these really large AI models. Um, uh, it's good to also think about the impact that this has in the world that we live in. So let's go over the first section first, which is risk to humans by these AI models. So discrimination against groups, which we touched on a little bit already. There's lots of examples of language models specifically discriminating against certain groups of people by exhibiting this sort of stereotypical bias, um, which is just like an overgeneralized belief that might exist in training data of these models that in some contexts can be extremely harmful to certain groups of people. So for example, if you look at the image on the top uh, left, um, if you have a sentence that says something like, girls tend to be more dash, you want your model to fill something in there. Depending on the answer that the model chooses, you can see that some things are more like natively stereotypical than others. So saying soft as opposed to determined is just like a trope that women potentially have more than men. Um, some of these stereotypes are not inherently as harmful. But if you look at the bottom, where if you have a sentence that says he is an Arab from the Middle East, um, and if the model chooses the first option that says he's probably a terrorist with bombs as opposed to he is a pacifist, this is just inherently harmful to this entire demographic group, possibly uh, like just untrue for all people in that group. Um, and it's just really biased if this is something that the model encodes in itself just by virtue of it having seen something like this in the training data some amount of times. Um, and what these papers at the bottom have shown is that if you actually just like go over hundreds and hundreds of these samples to try to look at um, how models might be biased in these stereotypical ways. Um, lots of language models just in their pre-trained form when you haven't tried to fine tune them to mitigate these biases exhibit so many of these stereotypical beliefs um, that discriminate against lots of demographic groups. Um, and the reason this probably happens and there's lots of work that looks into this as well at the bottom is Training data, and also I guess just like human history in general, has had this pattern of unfairness and unjustness and bias towards certain demographics or groups of people. Um, and I guess like this historical data is encoded on the internet and in books and just like in movies and other historical data that exists. And this has now infiltrated into the level of AI models replicating this because this is a pattern that they have seen. So that's one potential thing that models are building on but now also just like exacerbating because they've trained on this data and now they're trying to generalize it to new situations where it's not true anymore because this was just in the history before. Um, what another thing to consider, and we'll go over the second point a little bit more later, is that the training data is also super biased if some communities are just represented more than others. So for example, if men for some reason were represented way more than women in all of the training data sets of the language models, they're going to be far more accurate at making generalizations or saying things about men, but they might be like incorrectly, stereotypically biased towards women. And this holds more, not really for gender that we've seen so much um, in results, but usually for demographic groups. So for example, people in the Western part of the world, most of the data on the internet comes from that part of the world, as opposed to just like some tiny little town in India or Africa where people aren't actually producing that much data that goes on the internet that then goes into these models, which means those communities are just not represented in the data, which just inherently just allows the models to be biased by virtue of them not being aware of all of the things that those communities represent. Um, so, and we see that this shows up in the models a lot. Um, another type of way that these models are unsafe um, 
is exclusionary norms. So when things are written in text, so for example, um, if you ask a model what a family is, by virtue of it just having seen the definition of a family in lots of standard texts and novels and books, it might answer in this way where it says a family is just a man and a woman who get married and have children. This is true in like the prototypical definition of a family, but it's actually really exclusionary because now in this day and age, there's lots of different types of families and being able to represent and like have a space for all of those is important and having a language model just like output the fact that those might not exist in its worldview might be discriminatory towards certain groups. Um, and in studies where people actually ask humans how they feel about this, um, they've seen that this can actually place like a psychological tax on humans and it's just unfair um, to these groups of people to not represent them and might exacerbate biases in future versions of this model. Another thing um, that people have seen, um, and this is something that's just actively harmful to people interacting with the models, is like the propensity of models to generate toxic language, or in the case of vision models, to generate like really obscene images. So you as a user, when you're using a language model or a vision model, you're not really like signing any contract when you're interacting with them that says that um, that allows them to generate te text or image outputs that might be harmful to you. But in their training data, they have actually seen lots of like derogatory terms and slang and lots of toxic text. And what people have seen over and over again in lots of papers, and if you just go on Twitter, you'll see just like so many examples of people interacting with models and looking, seeing unsafe outputs from them. But models have a tendency to degenerate into toxic and harmful text, which again places this psychological tax and is super harmful to users that unknowingly might just be interacting with, with these systems and not being aware that they have this ability to generate harmful output. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in mind also when deploying these uh, AI systems as products. Um, the performance mismatch is also an important thing to go over. So groups for whom language models are biased are actually typically also groups that have historically been marginalized. So we discussed a little bit the representation bias. So these groups of people don't typically exist in the data set a lot. And what we've actually seen is that models perform a lot worse for these groups as opposed to other groups. So what people, and there's some studies on this and ways to mitigate this that we'll go over later, but what people have seen is that when you do user studies with, let's say, people in the Western part of the world interacting with, let's say, a vision generation or a language model, as opposed to a community in South India that's interacting, uh, and I'm just referencing one specific study, but when they're interacting with language models as opposed to people in the US interacting with language models, um, what people in these studies have reported is that models will just refuse to answer if the type of English that you speak is just very different from Western English. Um, and this just stems from the fact that these demographic groups of people are just not represented well enough in the data and your products just have like this inequity in terms of how they choose to respond to certain groups of people just by virtue of them having seen so much of the data and being well accustomed to responding to a type of English as opposed to another type of English, um, which again is unfair in that it now gives us these products that don't work equally well for everyone, um, but only work well for some privileged groups of people and not well for the rest of the world. Um, Another thing, so now apart from discrimination, which is a whole area of study in itself, there's a second big area of study, which is looking into the misinformation that these models might propagate. So these are examples from this one paper that did a few studies with these language models, where if you look at um, the first question at the top, where let's say you ask a language model, uh, you prompt it with saying, I suddenly have a headache, I feel faint and nauseous, and I see double, is my health at risk? This could potentially be a very serious concern. So these are actually all the symptoms of an aneurysm, but the language model might just reply and say, no, actually, you're just hungover, or like, it's not a big deal, you should just go back to sleep. And this could just very negatively impact this person's life, might just cause like immediate medical concerns. Um, and there's lots of risks of this false or misleading information that if users rely on these AI systems too much without being aware of the safety risks could be really harmful to them. Um, and they're also just like not factually correct very often. So you can see at the bottom where if you just ask them, what are the main differences between traffic rules in the UK versus India? 
uh, the model says, in India, cars drive on the left. In the UK, you drive on the right. And that's actually wrong, because um, they both drive on the same side. And in practice, I mean, this is a thing that could actually potentially affect someone's life, like if they try to drive on the other side of the road in that new country, um, but also just hints at the fact that these models just propagate a lot of misleading information in the world. Um, so it's uh, worth keeping in mind when deploying these systems as products or even using them for downstream tasks for any new applications that you might want to take a language or a vision model for is that their factual knowledge of the world is not always correct and not being aware of this and just assuming that they're perfect models of language or of vision could actually have really harmful downstream effects if this is just a model that you give off to another application that then ends up um, harming humans by virtue of the factual incorrectness. And especially in sensitive domains like legal advice or medical advice, this can cause a lot of harm to humans and also could lead to like legal or unethical actions and issues that you as the person that produced that model might end up having to face. Um, there's also privacy concerns. So what people have noticed is so specifically in the case of language models, because they've now been trained on just all of the data on the internet and Reddit posts and Twitter posts and things that like you as a user might unknowingly have just put out there on the internet. Um, they found for like quite a few cases of individuals, if you just ask for the address and phone number of a certain person, this data somehow actually does exist on the internet just by virtue of so many people just putting information out there that they can actually just like retrieve this information. but. More importantly, if this was someone else that had some malicious intent that was asking a language model this question, they're leaking private information to you without um, consent of that person, presumably, um, which is just like a really harmful privacy concern. Um, and also, if you just ask for like classified information well, that might not actually exist on the internet, but there might be similar documents that exist on the internet, these models could just learn to infer from all of these documents, just like a potential secure, security vulnerability. Um, and this could be a big legal issue as well. Um, so it's also worth keeping in mind both for each individual's private data and information, um, but also potential privacy concerns of the models that you build and deploy downstream, that these models do have the ability to just capture and memorize a lot of the information in their training data. Um, and if this was combined with some sort of malicious intent of someone trying to steal this information, this could be really harmful um, to lots of individuals and also organizations that might suffer from the legal consequences of this. Okay, so I'm now going to go into the risk by humans, which I think just very nicely couples lots of points from the first section of all of the risks that the models could just be doing when unknowing humans, the so humans without malicious intent, without knowing or expecting any harmful output from the model, still might cause the model to prompt harmful output. But now in the second category, there's actually lots of like bad actors out there. There are hackers and people that want to actually steal data from people or reveal private information of people. And I think this combination of these maliciously intended individuals with models that do have all of these security concerns is one of the biggest areas of threat that do exist now, especially because these models can, at scale, kind of exacerbate the ability of individuals to do bad things. Um, so there's some examples that people have found that have actually caused issues. Um, one thing, so when we spoke about disinformation from the model and models' tendency to just say things factually incorrectly. This actually makes disinformation cheaper and more effective if people wanted that as a goal. So you, a, a classic example could be in a political campaign. Um, let's say there's two parties and one party wants to just like generate a lot of uh, misinformation um, and say something um, bad about the other party. They could have language models just generate like thousands of news articles and put this on the internet. Um, and as a user, it might be really hard for you to dis distinguish between a few different articles that are telling you different things about the world. Um, there is also, um, if you see, if you just like ask a model to just write an article about some vice president that's doing something really bad, the model can just like go into like this very detailed and seemingly like very real sounding article that you could just post on the internet. Um, and this could just immediately spread this new rumor that didn't exist before and is untrue. 
Um, they can also facilitate fraud and scams and targeted manipulation. So instead of, um, you know, just like standard phishing emails of just like one person just sending out to a few thousand people um, of emails that they have, with the help of AI models, they can now just like propagate the search a lot more, pretend to be people's family members and try to get information from them, but do this at a much larger scale than they could do before just by virtue of them being assisted by these AI models that have these unsafe behaviors. Um, they can also assist in code generation, which um, you will learn a lot more about, but language models are just very good at just generating good and coherent code. Um, Usually for good use cases is what they're trained for, but they can actually also do this for like cyber attacks and um, for like hacking other systems. So there's lots of instances of uh, and examples of how if you ask a language model to do something like hack an existing system, it can actually do this really accurately, um, which is a big security concern because you could now just use these to infiltrate any system. Um, and what they can also do is a lot of like illegitimate surveillance and censorship just by virtue of them being able to so much faster than humans just be able to like access and scrape through so much more data. Um, anything bad in terms of surveillance or censorship that a human wanted to do, they could do so much faster. Um, so I guess in summary, uh, what this section looks at is how intentional harm that users might want to inflict on other individuals can now just be sped up so much more with language models in the case of text, but also reinforcement learning models for just like any standard tasks with feedback that they can get or vision models or any other AI model. Um, they, it just kind of like lowers the cost of doing these bad slash illegal tasks because you now are assisted by an AI, AI model. Um, and it's really good to keep this in mind with any systems that are being released, which is like, could this facilitate some bad actor out there in the world? Which I think until a while ago when models just like weren't as good as they are now, maybe wasn't so much as a threat. But now that they actually do have all of these capabilities and there's just like so many examples, both listed here in this talk, but also if you just like scrape through all of the new examples of like how bad language models or vision models are, um, you'll see that they are actually being used in combination with this um, for many bad um, tasks. And then lastly, um, before we go into the technical stuff, um, another big risk to keep in mind is the risk to the environment when you're training these giant AI models. So obviously one thing to keep in mind is carbon emissions. So when we're training these giant language models or vision models or any model, um, especially at the size that they are now, as opposed to maybe five years ago, um, the energy demands that are required to train this and like the compute resources that you need um, are both massive in themselves. So they have like carbon emissions are a big issue because these reduce air quality and there's just so much more. There's lots of statistics and papers that compare um, the trying, like, trying to quantify carbon emissions from just training language models with how much humans might actually be producing as you know, like when they like fly from one location to another. And it's actually kind of ridiculous that just training a model is comparable to a human flying like across the world. Um, but then it's also worth keeping in mind that spending so much of this compute just on AI reduces the ability to use these energy demands in other areas of use. So for example, for rebuilding some structures in like some poverty stricken part of the world that might need these resources more is now a thing that these resources are being diverted away from and which is a thing to keep in mind. Um, apart from carbon emissions, this also affects the environment in terms of the demand for fresh water that's needed to cool all of the data centers, for example, that Google and Facebook and all the other big companies um, that have a lot of compute uh, have, um, which is very taxing in terms of water resources as opposed to just like air and carbon resources. Um, another way that this harms the environment, maybe not like the physical environment, but the world and the environment that we live in is the ability of these AI systems to now kind of undermine a lot of creative economies and people's livelihoods in the world. So sometimes content generated by AI 
might not strictly be in violation of copyright. So if they're generating text that looks really similar to a New York Times article, or if it's uh, like an audio generation model that's generating a song that like sounds really similar to a Taylor Swift song, but it's not exactly the same because the words are different and maybe like the exact tone sequence is different. Um, it's hard to actually pinpoint and try to put this as a liability off the model because if you compare the exact sequences, maybe they're not identical, but um, it is actually kind of an, inf an infringement on the rights of these artists because it's so similar to their outputs. That And if people now start relying on AI outputs instead of these artists that are pouring all of their time and energy into trying to be creative and make livelihoods from this, um, this is a risk to lots of people in this creative space um, that are firstly, I guess now, in danger of maybe losing their jobs, but also just suffer from the unfairness of their work having been stolen and now also just replicated at a really giant scale without their consent. Um, and this leads to the second point of how, again, so there's actually lots of instances of this exact copying that can be seen. So I think the New York Times actually did sue OpenAI recently because they found that lots of New York Times articles were actually replicated almost exactly by ChatGPT in the generated outputs. I think this is still an ongoing battle. Um, so there's lots of cases where you can actually take action against um, these uh, large companies when you are being acted upon unfairly. Although it's worth noting that it's really only just like big organizations that can do this. You know, like a small artist that has just like released like their own newspaper is probably not going to have the capacity to try to sue OpenAI. Um, but uh, it's worth noting that for one, Yes, you can actually take action against these companies, but also what is more, more common than the few cases where people have ret retaliated is this new sort of like loophole in copyright law where it's not exact figurism because maybe the exact text of the article differs a little bit from the New York Times article um, in like the placement of the words, but it's just like as a human, they're so similar that you might classify them as the same, but it's now technically not the same. So this now introduces like this weird loophole in policy and law and just like copyright law in general, um, which just makes things harder for people to just assess what is the right thing to do over here. Um, and then lastly, um, this AI generated content can also just take over the market for human authored work, which undermines a lot of their creative content. Um, and it might take over a lot of the economies of people and the livelihoods of people that do this for a living. Okay, so in summary from this first section, uh, what we went over here is all of the risks that AI models, and this is tailored to language models a little bit, but does broadly apply to just the general class of generative artificial intelligence models, but all of the risks that occur unknowingly, so when we just deploy these models without any malicious intent, we're just releasing them for the tasks that they were trained on, which is maybe just language modeling, um, or answering questions or just classifying images. There's still lots of risk to humans if we don't just like very carefully think about whether or not they're being discriminatory against certain groups, whether or not there's privacy concerns or they're spreading false information that could be harmful to the entire population and also just like weirdly weight the truth out there in the world, which makes it harder for humans to assess anything that we see on the internet. Um, then there's also the risk by humans. So the first case was when these, uh, when humans unknowingly interact with them, but if humans knowingly want to use these models uh, both to harm other people or perform illegal activities, it's now so much easier for them to do this, which is why um, it's worth keeping in mind when any model is deployed or like code is released on the internet that if there was a chance that this could severely and badly impact lots of different people in the world. This is worth keeping in mind and maybe having like safeguards for things that you release. And then there's also risk to the environment, both the physical environment in terms of like actively reducing air quality or demand on water resources, um, but also um, the like social environment that we live in by undermining a lot of the creative economies and the people whose livelihoods are, and jobs might now be kind of taken away by AI. Um, and I guess best practices from this section is to just like, there's lots of work now from mostly people in philosophy and law and policy that have laid down all of the things that you should be considering um, about how these models affect people's lives. So it's good to just like 
think about all of these. And there's also new practices that have been put into place, for example, like having ethics statements for any research papers that you, that you write, um, having data sheets for data sets, um, and things like that that properly safeguard potential risks. And now we're going to talk about how we ensure this with these like three rough areas of work in AI safety that try to actually train models better to mitigate these risks. Um, I'm going to stop for like half a second, see if anyone has any questions on this section. OK, if not, we, OK. Let's go into the different ways in which the community has tried to build models that go over this. So you guys will be learning about language models and RLHF and all of the terms that I'm going to talk about over here tomorrow and day after. So you will all be experts about this by then. So for now, I'm just going to briefly describe at a high level what each of these terms mean, but also feel free to interrupt me with any questions. Um, and we'll go over the different ways in which we can try to mitigate these risks to humans and by humans and to the environments um, that people in the AI safety community are working on. So the first one that we're going to talk about is fine tuning and alignment of models in lots of different ways. So the first obvious thing that um, people have been thinking of and that seems like a good mitigation strategy is there was clearly something that has been baked into these models during training that is giving them the ability to be biased or exhibit these unsafe behaviors. Um, and there's this now very standard paradigm in machine learning of pre-training models, for example, on lots of data on the internet, and then fine-tuning them on very specific data. And what the AI safety community has been trying to do is to see if you can now train, and it's usually just fine-tuning once the models have been trained on a lot of data, but can we just fine-tune these models to be less biased? Um, and this can allow us to also understand the safety issues better if we do actually see a difference on fine-tuning them in different ways as opposed to just seeing them in their pre-trained form when they did have a lot of biases in them. Um, so there's two different, two rough different ways in which you can fine-tune both language models and just like any AI models in general. There is supervised fine-tuning on safety data in this context and reinforcement learning from human feedback um, that you can do for language models. So I think you guys have entire tutorials on this coming up this week. But very briefly, what the supervised fine tuning does is, so this is actually not too different from the pre-training in the case of a language model. So in its pre-trained stage, what a language model has seen is just massive amounts of text data on the internet and sometimes vision data um, and other modalities on the internet. Um, but it's really just like learned to infer from like these giant streams of text what a good model of language is. So this is why it can just generate very fluent sentences um, that sound very human-like, because it's just seen so much human-like data on the internet. Um, what, where fine-tuning comes in is, because this model that's just been pre-trained pre is just a very general model of language. So it can just like talk about anything fairly well, but maybe not very like specific domains really well. So if you just wanted it to answer questions about medicine, um, it wouldn't be as good as a model that was just trained entirely on medical data. Um, so where the supervised fine tuning comes in is if you had a small number of curated samples of just the domain that you care about. So for example, it could be just questions about um, medicine or just questions about law, or in this case, maybe just lots of sentences or lots of questions that just carefully only look at safety-related tasks. Or maybe they just have, they upweight the distribution of non-toxic data in this data set. So all the data over here doesn't have any like racial slurs. It doesn't look like Twitter data that was really biased. Um, and it's just like carefully curated data that is that maybe represents people equally. Um, if we now fine-tune models that have been pre-trained on this data, over these policies that we're carefully considering, like representation, discrimination, and stereotypes. Um, this might actually make the model slightly safer now, because the more recent data that it has seen in the supervised fine tuning stage um, is a lot less bad than all of the data on the internet. And what people have seen is that, yes, the supervised fine tuning on safety data does actually help mitigate this a little bit. However, it comes a little bit at the loss of just like the general 
I guess, like the general language understanding capabilities of the model. So maybe the model will now be less good at like things that it was good at before, like arithmetic reasoning, because it's most recently only seen data of this domain. Um, so there's like lots of research questions at the intersection of how to balance this, like how to better fine tune models, but still letting them retain ability on all of the different tasks before that we cared about. The second thing, um, the second, I guess, paradigm of fine tuning is there's lots of different terms for it. You, like, it's usually just reinforcement learning from human feedback, um, but it can also just be called reward fine tuning. Over here, um, I think you guys had a reinforcement learning lecture at some point, but this, it's fairly similar to any standard reinforcement learning setup. But over here, essentially what we're trying to do is train the model to learn from rewards where the rewards come from human preferences. So what this means is, let's say you have some sort of black box reward model that has been trained with lots and lots of pairs of humans um, where the humans upvote or downvote samples of text that it sees. So for example, if you just think of two examples of like a sentence that a language model generates that is really stereotypically biased versus a sentence that a language model generates that was very good and it wasn't discriminatory. Um, humans, if they're looking at lots of these samples, will probably upweight the ones that are like fairer and less biased. And if you have lots of data sets of this safety specific data and you try to collect human preferences to build a reward model that can now emulate this, you can now just use reinforcement learning with this reward model such that when you're training this language model and it's generating outputs, it can now get either like an upvote or a downvote on how, how much a human might have preferred the thing that it said as opposed to something else that it might have said. Um, over here, specifically in the context of safety, but this general paradigm also holds just for like better quality or fluency of language model generations. Um, so one way to try to mitigate this is with fine tuning. And it's worth noting that there's just so many different variants of supervised fine tuning and reward fine tuning. Um, and I've added some papers at the end of this, so feel free to check all of those out. Um, some other examples is, uh, so there's work from Anthropic on trying to use uh, this curated safety specific data, but also safety specific reward models in combination with these um, supervised fine tuning, we call it SFT, or, re or reinforcement learning with human feedback, which I'm gonna call RLHF um, approaches. So instead of just having one reward model, like we saw over here, what the constitutional AI paper looks at is trying to build reward models for different constitutions. So let's say you have one model that tries to only look at the rule of um, not being stereotypical, and then another model only looks at the rule of never giving medical advice or never giving legal advice, maybe, maybe coupling together outputs from these models and these different constitutions is what they call them, might help, um, might help these models be safer, and they show that yes, this actually does improve quite a lot. Um, and there's also, this can also be incorporated into the loss of the model during training. So there's this paper on trying to add these like contrastive pairs of like good and bad um, inputs and constitutions to the model. And they show that this also does improve how this model is preferred to another model in terms of the safety or the fluency of that model. Um, another thing that people look at, um, also related to the fine tuning and alignment, but from a different perspective, is trying to add diversity in the perspectives of these language models. Um, and the high level motivation of this is to try to incorporate multiple perspectives from different people to build fairer models. Um, so what people, and where this comes from, again, we've touched on this a little bit in the risk section with representation of humans, but with most of the data that exists on the internet, and even with the vision data, as we saw in that example of the gender shades of people's skin colors, um, people are misrepresented in the training data of these models. Um, and in the case of people's opinions and their perspectives or how they feel about what is safe or unsafe to them, this is also just very misrepresented in the data. So there's lots of studies that have looked at um, disagreements between humans that come from different communities. So on the left, you can see even for a non-safety specific task, so for a very standard, so this is just called like a natural language inference task where you just wanna see if two sentences are similar, so if they entail each other or if they're very different. If you look at the sentence at the top that says the capital of Slovenia 
is so and so with this number of inhabitants. And you ask people to say if the sentence is definitely true or definitely false or kind of uncertain, they don't know. There's actually just like a weirdly big distribution of people's opinions on this, which kind of just shows how one, uh, there's, there's like a miscalibration of like factuality and like what people know about the world, but it's also like people's priors affect the way that they reason about something. So there might be a reason that a person believes that the population of um, that country is different, um, pro maybe because there's like unspecified information over here. But in summary, humans disagree a lot, even on non-subjective tasks. So this was a very objective question that's just about the population of a place. Um, and what they show is that if you actually look at individual human annotators instead of just like one aggregate, people don't agree and they disagree a lot on standard questions. But actually, if you see on the right, so what they do over here is they collect safety specific data and preference data from different parts of the world. So they pool people from the US and from India and from Africa and from the UK. Um, and they try to collect their preference data. And also there's other work that tries to collect safety data. And what they actually see over here very strikingly is that the demographics of people are kind of just the, 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 the cultural history of a person influences their perception of what they think is safe or unsafe to them. So if you, there's lots of examples in these papers that, um, are, that I've linked at the bottom of if you show an image, let's say of a black person being arrested by a policeman or of like a slightly pornographic image or a sentence that was toxic in a certain way to these people from all of these different demographic groups. There is a huge disagreement across demographic groups on what people think is safe or unsafe from their perspective. But people within a demographic group usually actually agree a lot. So black people are just way more triggered by that example because of like the cultural context and the history um, and like the personal history that they've had with that. Um, and then, and there's lots of reasons why the demographics of people, for example, the locations that they've lived in, the languages that they speak might affect their perspectives. But this is actually not represented at all in the data that we see on the internet. So there's lots of ongoing work over here to first build these data sets. So try to upweight the distribution of data that these language models have seen either during pre-training or in fine tuning in lots of different ways to actually account for the full distribution of perspectives that exists around the world. Um, and see if this actually makes models fairer. Um, and there's lots of ways in which you can use this diverse data to build less biased and stereotyping models um, in lots of different ways because models now actually account for perspectives and they can output a full distribution um, over different people and different demographic groups' perspectives instead of just maybe um, consorting to like the Western part of the world and what they believe is safe or unsafe to them. Um, we touched on this a little bit before also, but um, another way that people are trying to bring about and account for these changes is doing lots of user studies um, and also empirical studies to understand the socio-technological harm of these systems to different demographic groups. Um, so on the left, um, there's this really nice recent study um, that collects data from lots of different dialects of English. So English as spoken in the US is actually very different from English spoken in the UK, which is different from English spoken in Australia um, and in India and in different parts of Africa. Um, and you can actually, so there's lots of work in like this um, machine translation slash dialect community uh, where they can like detect features of text that come from these different demographic groups that they're speaking exactly the same language that might be represented in text form in very similar ways but when you're looking at audio input um, and even in text input, like the, the phrasal structure often actually quite differs across dialects. This study evaluates chat GPT empirically. So they collect um, thousands of samples from native speakers of each dialect of the same language of English. Um, and they give all of these examples and interactions into ChatGPT to see if there's a difference in the output of the model. And they actually see really strikingly that the model will usually respond really well to standard American English and then maybe standard British English, the second best, but any other dialect of English, so any, so like Indian and Jamaican and even Irish English when written in text form, models might just refuse to respond 
um, or they might give slightly incorrect responses and the fluency is just might not be as good as if the English that you type in sounds like standard American English, which is obviously just like a huge bias issue in terms of the inequity of deploying these models to different demographic groups. Um, on the right, um, there's work that did user studies with um, South Asian natives, uh, South Asian Indian natives um, when, when interacting with these language models. Um, and they compare the difference between people in the Western part of the world as opposed to people in South India. And they see that quite strikingly, these people that are native speakers of like a different type of English, even when they're just interacting with the models in English, um, they say that they recall lots of instances when the technology just doesn't understand them well, even though they're just like speaking in their native English language. Um, and uh, uh, this is again, like another source of bias. Um, there's lots of work that tries to, um, actually I should say there's not enough work, but there is some work that tries to um, fix this in models by virtue of collecting more data and trying to incorporate into the model different languages, both just like dialects within a language, but also low resource languages, for example, for all of like the hundreds and thousands of languages that exist in the world into these models to try to make sure that they're generalizing away from standard American English to the other dialects of English, but then also the other dialects of Russian and Chinese and Taiwanese and all of these languages that exist out in the world. Um, and the dialects of the languages within them because there are so many humans. If you look at the populations of humans that exist in the world that want to use these systems and might benefit from them, um, we're not able to reach them just because of how biased and overly representative to what is one part of the world the models are. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna talk about, um, this is like a fairly new community. It's called like the Mechanistic Interpretability Community. And there's lots of very exciting work here being done on aligning language models to being safer, but more importantly, just understanding what parts of the model might contribute to these behaviors that we're seeing and then figuring out how to fix them. Um, so the main motivation for a lot of this work is just interpretability of these giant models that are just so big now that it's hard to just like uncover from like these millions of neurons what's actually happening in the model. Um, so there's lots of work, um, and I posted lots of links at the end of this also, on um, trying to uncover from these giant models what the structure of the models is to understand them better. Um, so like back in the day when the machine learning models were just like really simple MLPs that were just two layers, you could actually just like decode everything from the model or build like a linear probe that just shows you everything that's happening in terms of the features being represented. But with these giant CNNs for vision models, like giant reinforcement learning models that have so many different components, it's hard to do this now. Um, so there's work on feature disentangling where um, if you have this giant model, maybe what you want to do is learn how to project from this giant space into a much so smaller space that could now, like before, be interpreted by virtue of it just being so much smaller. Um, there's some pretty new work on sparse autoencoders, which is similar motivation of trying to decompose into a smaller space that's more interpretable, but they actually have lots of findings over here on things that you can find with respect to bias in language models. So you can find like what layers in the model or what components in the model correspond to different behaviors that we're seeing. Um, there's um, lots of this, I'm gonna, call it circuit finding work that covers things like activation patching and path patching. And essentially over here, the main motivation of this work is if you consider like a transformer language model that just has so many layers of uh, so many attention layers um, that have lots of maybe MLPs in between them. And there's like a residual stream that goes through the entire model. We don't really know where in the model or like what different parts of the model are contributing to the model reasoning about a certain topic. And what the activation patching and path patching work tries to do is tries to run many forward passes of the model on one sample. So for example, let's say we have an input sample that says something, um, I said I don't have a good example here, but um, a sample that exhibited some stereotypical bias from a language model. At the point in the sentence when the model does say something stereotypical, if you can run a pass through the model 
and try to see which neurons contribute the most to that stereotypical word. And you can do this because there's lots of theory on causality that um, can tell you how to mask out a certain neuron and try to assess its effect on the output. So like the causal input, uh, the causal effect of a certain part of the model on the output. And if you do this many times, you can try to uncover an entire part of the model, and this is what they call a circuit, um, that corresponds to some behaviors of the model, which could be biased behaviors. There's also work that tries to uncover why, how models do like perform these very like intelligent mathematical reasoning tasks. Um, but this work has actually been pretty helpful in Firstly, just understanding if there's a part of the model that always contributes to gender bias or stereotypical bias, um, which then hints at the fact that if you can now mask this part of the model out or do something more clever like attribution patching, maybe you could try to nullify this bias in the model or maybe like change the model in slightly different ways or retrain it by trying to remove certain components of the model. Um, and there's just lots of interesting work that should build off of the findings of um, all of the activation patching work specifically related to safety um, as opposed to the rest of the natural language understanding tasks. So in summary, this was just a brief overview of the different areas of work. And I should also add that this is a work that, so it's, a, it's kind of a new field just because the models have gotten so good so quickly lately um, that there's lots of growing work in these areas. Um, so each of these sections probably even today, I have had like five new papers on each of these. Um, so it's definitely ongoing work um, that is growing every single day, um, but is mostly rooted in these different areas that I've tried to cover. Um, and if anyone wants to talk more about this, feel free to reach out. I would love to talk about safety. Um, but I'm just going to summarize the things that we covered over here in the second section. So in the first section, we talked about all of the risks of generative AI and the things that we should keep in mind. Um, and in the second section, we covered three roughly different areas that people in the field have been trying to work on to try to build a path towards safer AI, like both language model and vision model and any other AI model systems. Um, this can be done through just like better training of the model. So even if they have been trained already, and maybe this was like a really compute intensive task and we don't want to retrain them, um, you could still try to uncover or recover some of those biases by further fine tuning them to align towards humans. And this is what is usually termed as alignment. Um, adding diversity in the perspectives of these models. So because we've seen that there's so much misrepresentation and also humans just like feel so differently about so many different things that it just seems incorrect to just ask a language model to represent only some humans' perspectives on these tasks, which is why it's important to both collect more resources and do more studies, but then also build into the algorithms underlying these models um, ways in which they can represent maybe not just an output, maybe not just one output, but maybe like a whole distribution of outputs that maybe caters towards different groups of people. So it takes into account different people's perspectives, um, which is maybe just like a fundamentally um, underlying difference in how the language modeling process works that people are working on. Um, and then lastly, the interpretability community has done lots of work in trying to understand like firstly, how the language model, like why language models are so good in the first place, like what parts of the model contribute to the good behavior, like when they're answering a question correctly, can we determine where in the model this correct answer comes from? But this has also been applied to a lot of safety tasks. So they've also found where in the model a lot of like the bias lies and why it says bad things. And you can also now steer models towards generating better outputs. Um, if you've uncovered these parts of the models that you have found are bad, but also if you've now understood things about the model better, maybe rethinking a training pipeline because of just like having light of all of these issues um, is definitely the path forward towards building safer systems. And with that, I'm going to take any questions if anyone has one, um, but also feel free to just reach out. I've left my email over there if you just want to chat about safety or just have questions or yeah, if you're just excited about the space and just want to know more. Um, like I said, there's so much happening every single day in this space. Um, it's almost hard to keep track, but, but yeah, with that, I will take questions and if not,